Acts chapter 16 is the start of Paul's second missionary journey. And just to give you an idea and a context, over the course of Paul's life, he probably walked well over 10,000 miles, 16,000 kilometers in his missionary journeys. And he's already been through one, and, and at this point, by the time we get to the part in this chapter that we are going to spend time on regard, uh, when, it, when we're talking about the imprison, imprisonment of Paul and Silas, he's probably already walked 3,000, 4,000 kilometers. His mission, his calling on his life led him to many journeys, four, four missionary journeys as it's, as it's categorized, through various cities, strength, uh, first of all, preaching the gospel, then planting churches, and strengthening those churches on repeated um, missions and letters that he wrote to them, strengthening and encouraging each and every one of those churches. And that we see in, in uh, chapter 16, verses 1 through 5, where in verse 5 it says, So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. And as, as Paul went through this area, as he went on his mission, he, he kept not only telling people about Christ, but then visiting the churches that they had planted and encouraging them and strengthening them. And then we move on in verse 6 where uh, uh, Paul, uh, we'll, we'll read it right now. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. So even in his mission, as he's, as he's traveling and going and speaking and sharing the gospel and planting churches, we find here, even in these few verses, how sensitive he is to the Holy Spirit, in, even in the areas that he's going into. His mission was to go and speak the word. Yet he was sensitive and listening to the Holy Spirit. It's like the Holy Spirit was with him every step of the way, and he's listening and hearing, no, not in this place, not at this time. And it's not just him listening, he's also being obedient. Sometimes our, our enthusiasm, our vigor can get us in trouble, can put us in places where we are speaking and saying things without listening to the Holy Spirit for guidance. And Paul here is listening, he's sensitive, and then in the night he has a vision and direction is provided for him. That direction is to go to Macedonia, and he ends up in Philippi. And when he ends up, he and Silas and Timothy, when they end up in Philippi, which is uh, what is defined here as the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, they were there several days. And when they were there several days, on the Sabbath day, they decided they wanted to pray. So in verse 13 it says, And on the Sabbath day we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. And I want to pause for a second there and paint the picture. All these things, I'm running through these verses because I'm, I'm wanting to kind of give you the full context of what is happening here, uh, the background so that we can really understand the, the situation in which Paul and Silas were in. When, when, they, when they went to pray by the river at the Sab on the Sabbath, it was because there was no synagogue in Philippi. There was no synagogue in Philippi. And why was there no synagogue in Philippi? Because Jewish custom or Jewish law permits them to build a synagogue 
if there are at least 10 Jewish men as a congregation. So you can see that this didn't exist in Philippi because they had no synagogue. So then what is the next step? What is the alternative there? The alternative is to meet by a river because uh, before you pray and uh, before you pray and worship, you're supposed to wash your hands, wash your feet and wash your face and down by the river, it would allow them that opportunity to clean their hands, etc. So this was not, oh, let's go down by the river and have church. It wasn't, an, it wasn't necessarily, you know, the ideal situation for them. In fact, the river in this situation was about two to three kilometers outside the city. So they were taking time, these, these women were taking time to go outside the city down a few kilometers where Paul and Silas and others possibly were meeting to pray and worship on the Sabbath. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us, verse 14. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul, and when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. There's an important thing to, uh, some important things to note about Lydia here, too, is that a little bit of Lydia's background. It says here she is from the city of Thyatira. That was a few hundred kilometers away from uh, Philippi. That was where the, you would say the manufacturing hub or one of the manufacturing hubs of the purple cloth, the, the expensive purple cloth was. So she had traveled a few hundred kilometers because of her trade to sell, to make a living. But here on the Sabbath, she has blocked it off and she has joined the others to worship God. Now one thing to keep in mind is that there was no five or six day work week. Every day the market was open. Every day they worked. But she had separated the Sabbath day out. So she was probably sacrificing some income. She was probably losing some customers because she deemed it important to keep the Sabbath day for the Lord, the Lord's day. And I just want to pause and challenge us for a moment here on what it means to keep the Lord's Day holy. There's plenty of scripture and writings that we can research and look up. I want to challenge each and every one of us to do that. Many of us will, uh, may sit here and say, well, I haven't been convicted to stop this or stop that or do this or don't do that. You know, it's sometimes pretty hard to get convicted if we are actually not seeking the Lord's guidance on something. If we are just ignoring it and throwing it to the back burner and we're just going on day to day, we just become desensitized and ignore what is there. But the Lord's day is to be set apart. And Lydia here had set it apart and came. And it says that she worshipped God. But the interesting thing, one of the interesting things here, is that in verse 14 it says that she worshipped God. And the next line it says, the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And then she and her household were baptized. So that's a little strange. Or is it? She worshipped God probably meant that she was very religious, she was God-fearing, she honoured the Sabbath, she honoured the law. But it's very clear that she had not taken a step and put her entire trust in God. Maybe no one had explained it to her like Paul did. And we come here on Sunday mornings and we, we uh, play in the worship team, we we are welcoming people in. We're working in the sound booth. We're doing different things in different ministries. All in the name that we're worshipping God. 
But it's very clear here that we actually have to consciously take that step. Consciously take that step that we are putting our hope and our trust in God and make it a reality where the Lord is really the Lord of our lives. And so because of Paul's journey here and meeting Lydia, her whole family is saved and baptized. It says her household. And we're moving on here in verse 16. In the next section we see that there is a slave girl who's possessed with a spirit, with a, a demon, and is now following them around over the course of a few days. And in verse 17, it says, This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. For many days. If someone was following me around for a few minutes, I would have got annoyed. But it says here that she was following them for many days. And finally, Paul gets greatly annoyed. And what does he do? He commands the spirit out of her. Just think, picture that in your head. You're walking around doing your business and someone is uh, proclaiming it out to everyone. Ah, this guy is a great businessman and he's just following you and walking with you everywhere. But Paul was also sensitive, probably knowing that this is not how they want to share the good news. People might turn around and say, well, it's good, right? She was like proclaiming it out there, telling everyone. That's not always the best way to, to do it. And it also was causing disturbance. And so he commanded it out of her. And what happened? Her masters who were making money off of her activity were now down one business line. The profitability from it was gone. And so what did they do? They cooked up a plan. They gathered a few people, created some trouble, grabbed Paul and Silas and took them in and, and made all kinds of false accusations against them. And long story short, they got them thrown in jail. And, and you can see here, before they got thrown in jail, in verse 23, and when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So this is Paul and Silas's reward, right? Walk a few thousand kilometers, do the work of the Lord. In the process, people are getting saved, families are getting saved and baptized. And what do they get for it? Falsely accused, beaten, and thrown in prison. And, and the guard was so sternly warned that he put them in the deepest, innermost part of the prison. And this is the part now that I want us to focus on for a few minutes and pull some points out as we, as we uh, go through this part of the chapter, verse 25 down. Verse 25, But at midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Let's pause there for a second. In the night, getting beaten, in the inner part of the prison or the jail, probably quite dark, their feet in stocks, in chains, probably unable to get a comfortable position to sleep. If you lay down, your back has been beaten. Just picture this. I've walked 3,000 kilometers, 4,000 kilometers. I'm doing the work of the Lord and here I am. And what were Paul and Silas doing at that time? You and I sometimes, when we have one small thing go wrong, Say, why me, Lord? Why, Lord? What is going on? What has happened to me? I'm doing your work. I'm doing so much for you. But that's not what Paul and Silas said. When we're going through these dark moments, in the midnight... Are we like Paul and Silas, praying and singing? 
When your life is in shackles or chains, what are you doing? We know what we are... I can tell you what you're probably doing when life is good. When life is going well. When a good business deal comes through or your family is healthy. Then we're praising God. Giving him all the glory. Shouting it from the mountaintops. But in the dark night, in the dark season, in the sh- when I'm in shackles, when I'm uh, emotionally distressed, when I'm struggling, when things are not going the way that I planned, then what is my attitude? What is my approach? What is my outlook? In my prison moments, in my dark moments, in my midnight ah, what is my attitude see the same God now we sang this a couple of times to the same God that is with me through the good times through the mountaintop experiences that same God is the God who is with me in my midnight hour See, Paul and Silas recognized that the God that was walking with them from city to city, the God that was with them when they were sitting down with people and sharing the good news, the God that was with them who was there to help them plant churches, to lead people, to baptize them, is the same God that was sitting with them in that prison. You know, I, I think sometimes we mistake and we almost, in our minds, subconsciously, we have different characteristics for our God. In the sense that when we are going through a tough time, we think or picture God in a different way than when we are going through a good time. See, God doesn't change, right? Our situations may change. Our circumstances may change. What's happening right now may change. What's happening in my body may change. What's happening in my business may change. What's happening out there might change, but God doesn't change. God is the same. When we didn't have any of these crises six, nine months ago, God was still there. And he was still the same God that is there even now through your crisis. Some of us are like, God, no, I I don't have this to get around. I don't have proper transport. I don't have proper cooking material, etc. And we can go on and on. But we need to recognize that That same God that is there during the times of provision is the same God that is there when there's a little bit of a struggle. Now, Pastor Aisha said this a few weeks ago. As much difficulty as there has been over the last few weeks or few months, many of us have not really suffered. We've been very inconvenienced. I'm plagiarizing her words. We've been very inconvenienced. But many of us, I know some of us are suffering, but many of us, as of now, have not suffered. But yet we are complaining, we are disturbed, we are wondering, God, what is going on? We are looking for uh, the first way out of this situation. And we are not understanding that... I'm standing here when I'm talking to a friend or witnessing to someone and saying, my God is the God of the impossible because while things are going well, I'm excited. I've got this energy. God is blessing me. He's the God of the impossible. And then when things get a little tough, that energy subs- goes down. And, even, and we'll probably say, I, yeah, yeah, I believe he's the God of the impossible. I believe 
and that conviction, that, that deep down knowledge that he's going to carry me through. He might have me in this situation for a reason. I'm still going to worship him like he's the same God. Paul and Silas are sitting there and they're singing and praying. And, and in verse 25, the, the last part of it says, and the prisoners were listening to them. <clears throat> the prisoners were listening to them. Church, you and I, even when we're going through our bad times, the same people that we've been singing to and telling, God is good all the time, God is the God of the impossible. In the bad times, they're also watching you and I. Are you, are you walking the walk at that time as well? Are you trusting God? Do you believe in the impossible in those moments as well? See, the prisoners here, they probably had heard everything that had gone out. News gets about. And they're listening to Paul and Silas singing and praying. People are watching us. People are observing you. They may not say something to you, but they know and they see. You know, uh, in Genesis, we go to another prison moment here when uh, um, Joseph was in prison. In Genesis 39. And you know, he too was falsely accused. He too was... Um, uh, put in prison wrongfully. And then in verse 21 of chapter 39 in Genesis, I'll just read a couple verses here. It says, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. I can't help but imagine that if Joseph was sitting there moping and complaining and whining and saying, I shouldn't be here, I did nothing wrong, this wasn't anything that I did, and creating problems or whining in that prison, I can't help but think that the prison guard would probably not have put him in charge. See, our attitude, our outlook, even in the tough times, even in the difficult times, it brings about an atmospheric change. Whether it's Paul and Silas singing in the prison, in the dark hour, whether it's Joseph in the, in the prison cell, it says here that he found favor. The Lord gave him favor. And the keeper of the prison committed everything. That means under Joseph, he didn't even know what was going on. He said he did not look into anything under Joseph's authority. That is what the right attitude in your times of distress can do. It can bring peace into a situation. It can bring life into a situation. It allows the Lord to use you for different things. Just like Joseph was placed in that position at that time. And so here, Paul and Silas, while they are singing and praying, the other prisoners are listening to them. And then at that moment, verse 26, there's an earthquake. It says, suddenly there was a great earthquake, earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loose. Yes, hallelujah, great. My miracle has come through. I can run out. And escape the situation. Wouldn't that be what a lot of us would think at that moment? When you are in the middle of a storm, in the middle of your prison, something happens to calm your storm or to loosen your chains. 
the first reaction that you and I will have is it's a miracle. God is at work for me. He's giving me a way out. Let me take it and run, run, run. Let me escape my situation. Let me escape this problem. He has opened a door, now I can run. If we are truthful and honest with ourselves many a times, that's our thought and our approach. But we see here in verse 27 and verse 28, and the keeper of the prison awakening, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then, with, then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced having believed in God with all his household. So when the earthquake happened, when the, trouble, when, when the trouble was going on, and then there was a release, a potential for Paul and Silas to be released and escape, what did they do? They remained. I'd like to think that they were aware. They were more aware than maybe sometimes we give them credit for. They were aware, they were sensitive to the situation. They understood that, you know, if they escape, if they run out, then they are fugitives on the run. Also, they probably understood the plight of the guard as well. If, prison, if, you're, if you're kept in charge of the prisoners and they take off under your watch, that's why the guard was about to kill himself. He was about to save himself from someone else killing him or torturing him. But even in that moment, Paul and Silas understood and probably because of their actions and because of the peaceful environment that their singing and their praying had brought on them, there seemed to be no urgency for the other prisoners to run out either. See what creating an atmosphere, an environment where the Holy Spirit is present in can do. Just before the, pris uh, the prison guard was about to kill himself, they stopped him and said, we are all here. So what can we learn from this? From this time that Paul and Silas were in prison and in the stocks and in their deepest, darkest moment. Well, maybe not their darkest moment, but similar to deep, dark moments that we would experience in our lives. Now, just because you walk three, four thousand kilometers, you preach the gospel, you plant churches, doesn't absolve you from struggles and issues in life. No matter how much you witness, no matter how much you may be living for God, no matter how much you come and do and serve for God, it doesn't necessarily mean that you and I will be devoid of persecution, will be devoid of trials. You've heard this over and over again. This is a reminder to you. They were falsely accused. Secondly, how do you and I handle that adversity when we face that persecution, the troubles, the issues in life? How do we handle it? How do we process it? What is our outlook? What is our um, attitude through the trial? through the difficulty.
Remember the context here, the Paul and Silas, what they had gone through and now they are in prison. Where they found themselves, they are praying and singing. They are not running from the, the problem the first chance they get. This is about mindset. This is about being in tune with the Holy Spirit. This is about allowing the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you every step of the way. Remember earlier in the story, they were on a mission to preach and to share the word, but there were areas in which they were told not to. They were listening. They were sensitive. In the prison, when the prison doors were open and their chains were loose, they could have run out, but they remained. Thirdly, and finally, the adversity that you and I face, and also the miracle that you and I may receive after that adversity, many times is not only for you or for me. Many times it's not just for me. See, sometimes during the adversity, we get so focused on ourselves, focused on our situation, we don't see what's going on around us. And when the miracle comes, the same thing happens. We are focused on receiving and rejoicing in that, and we forget that there could be something greater that could be accomplished. What was the something greater through the earthquake that happened? If it was just for me, I escape and run out of prison, or Paul. But the greater miracle was the verses after that, right? Because he remained. The prison guard's life, was, physical life was not only spared, but that beckoned him, called him, to find out from Paul, what, what's good, what is this that you have that I don't have? And to grab onto it and say, I want that. Who is this Jesus? I want to put my hope and trust in him that I can get beaten and put in prison for something I didn't do, but I'm still there singing and praying and worshiping him. The prison doors can be blown open, but I'm not running out, I'm not escaping. Who, who is this God that you serve? See, we could look at it like, yes, that miracle, um, there was a miracle, there was a blessing in the earthquake, and they could have run out. If they ran out, the prison guard and his family would not have received salvation. There's a bigger picture sometimes in the adversity we face, in the difficult, troubled times we face. I remember a long time ago listening to a preacher share this one time of how his, he used to always say that his dad used to always, he had a phrase he used to coin, just one more for Jesus. Just one more for Jesus. Everywhere he went, whether it was into the hospital, when he was sick, whether he was on a plane, wherever he went, just one more for Jesus. And his preacher told us that while his dad was lying, what turned out to be on his deathbed in the hospital, he went to visit him that morning, and he was, spent, he was with him, and with, weak, with weakness in his lungs, unable to speak that much, he got this guy to lean forward, and he whispered into his ear, he, he said, I've talked to the nurse about God, the one who's coming in right now. Finish the job, just one more for Jesus. He was telling his son, she's ready. I don't have breath in my lungs to do it right now, but you can. All the way till the final moment, even on his deathbed, he was thinking, just one more for Jesus. Oh, to have that attitude in every situation, in every dark moment, through all adversity, through all difficulty, through all pain, through all agony. There's something bigger going on here. 
It's not just about me. When you're facing a difficult time, we, ha we have to understand why are we going through this? It's not just for you and I. It's not just to mold you. It's to benefit others and to glorify God. God was glorified through this imprisonment. A family was spared and saved and baptized through this imprisonment. We need to stop focusing and being so tunnel visioned on our benefit, on our problem and how we get out of it. Yes, there are times when God gives us a blessing or, or removes us from a situation that is uh, very hard and difficult and it's a storm and he comes in and he calms the storm but in that moment what is your and my attitude is it simply to say thank you jesus now this is all for me or is it to say thank you jesus now how do we glorify you in this situation how do you get all the glory how do you get all the honor and how can we make this about you lord and not about me I feel many times we are, I'm laboring on this point because many times we are so self-absorbed. Looking at ourselves in the mirror, concerned about our problems. That even when God lifts us out of that, we're still focused on ourselves. Church, may we be a people that even in the deepest, darkest nights, even in our own prisons, in the darkest part, in the darkest hour, that we recognize that God who is with us there has the same capabilities and and he should be praised and glorified in the same ways as when we are enjoying a mountaintop experience.
Lord, we come before you this morning and we just want to thank you and praise you for the power of your word. And Lord, you know of all those who are gathered here this morning, you know specifically the ones going through prison experiences today, Lord. Lord, you know the ones going through difficulties, adversity, and, and Lord, uh, really needing to praise you in the storm. And I pray that as a, as a church in Sri Lanka, make us a praising people, make us a worshipping people. Lord, take away every bit of grumbling and complaining that sometimes comes to the surface and help us to be people who realize that you have set us here for a time, for a time such as this. And it's bigger than our breakthrough, it's bigger than our own problem. What you have set us here for is something that involves the salvation of souls, Lord. And so I pray that you will empower us, help us to have the right attitude in adversity, Lord, and help us to be the salt and the light wherever we are. And even this week, Lord, give us opportunities, Father. Lord, give us opportunities to praise you in the midst of our storms, to praise you in the midst of our prison experiences, and to just marvel at, at what you do through us when we humbly submit ourselves to you. So I cover each and every person here with your precious blood. I thank you for their lives, and I thank you for what you're doing in us, even in this dark time in our nation. Thank you that you are work, you are at work in our lives, Lord. And we just submit ourselves as we sang, I surrender all. We truly want to surrender every area of our lives to you, Lord. Not just to sing it, but actually to live it, Lord, so that you can have full authority and freedom to work in every area of our lives. In your mighty and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all and have a blessed week.